church to bring me here, and uh, Reuben as well. Yeah, it's a pretty big image there, isn't it? I'm not sure what we can do about that. Okay, occupy till I come. There we go. Can someone mess with this while I carry on? <laughs> see if you can bring it down a bit. And uh, we'll see some image up here. Well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to discuss a little bit about what we did last time, just to recap and then continue. So this is basically, we're going to be, what, having about four messages, including the first one, on this topic of the economy. The economy which uh, we need to identify and which we need to be a part of. And when I'm talking about the economy, I'm, of course, not talking about dollars and literal cents. I'm not talking about making money. In fact, um, if you look at the Bible and the book of First Timothy, you can, you can go there with me, in First Timothy chapter 6, um, this is one of the post-Acts books writing uh, to us in this particular age and therefore is addressing us with the economy which we need to grab a hold of and uh, implant on our souls and in our lives and make it a part of an everyday experience and walk with God. This is what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse uh, 8. It says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Boy, that goes a long way, doesn't it? Contentment. A lot of people don't have contentment. They're always after something else. They're after some big cash pile somewhere and they think that's going to make them happy. They think that's going to give them fulfillment in life. But in fact, it's illusory. It's not true. It doesn't happen. It says in verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Waste. Waste. Isn't it interesting that the metaphor here that's used is drowning. Drowning. I don't know whether you've ever nearly drowned or you've been in the presence of someone that's nearly drowned. But you know, it's an awful thing because drowning is essentially suffocating. And you can't get air. I've been in situations uh, in the sea where my body has been absolutely exhausted. And I'm not saying that I was in a position where I was contemplating giving up. But I could imagine someone giving up. I could imagine where you could get so tired that in the end you just give way to it. And you say, that's it. And um, we don't need to put ourselves in that position. But you could put yourself in that position by not adhering to the economy that we are really addressing, which is not about dollars and cents, literally. It says, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. With many sorrows. It's multifaceted, this. And you can put yourself into a lot of trouble by going off on the wrong keel to try and make yourself rich when you need to put your energy and time into the family that's right before you. That's the family of God which is right before you. There's, there's nothing in this that says that you should not make money. Of course not. Because we are given the command by God through Paul, to us in this age, if a man provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. See, it's very balanced, isn't it? It's a balanced book, and we need to have a balanced life. And so I want you not to come away from my talks with some false notion of what I'm talking about when I talk about the economy. It's a very important thing to get straightened out. So last time, um, we discussed a number of things. Uh, we looked at this passage, occupy. You know, it means set up a business. This is part of a parable. So God, through Jesus Christ, is now setting up this parable 
of an economy. And what is a parable? Well, it's something, para, that's alongside. It's parabole. It's something that's thrown alongside that we can see a parallel thought and from that come away with a deeper thought, which is put into, in the case of the, the, the book of Luke, something that Jesus is trying to convey to those people at that time. And we can certainly learn from it also. And it says here, And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And you can read through this thing, uh, and see exactly what happens with people who do not take the economy seriously. Those people who did not make with profit an increase from this 10 pounds, they are judged. They are judged. And even what they have is taken from them and given to those that have more. That is the lesson that you're learning from this parable, is that concerning the business that was to take place, concerning the kingdom of God, they were required to take this seriously and utilize the economy to publish the word of God and do God's business. Do God's business. And God is serious about this. That's the basic message that you can get from this. I showed you this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I tried to show you that, in fact, this, this message is something that people misquote and they get the wrong idea from. A person who says, I am a follower of Paul. Well, that doesn't tell me that you are necessarily any different from someone who is inside a doctrinal jail. Just because you say that you are a follower of Paul does not mean to say that you are out of the woods, doctrinally speaking. Why? Because look what it says. He modifies that. He modifies this command to the Corinthians, even as I also am of Christ. So we must ask the question, what was Christ interested in? What was Christ's example? What was he dispensing to Paul that Paul would then give himself as an example to? And notice this word imitation. The word there is literally imitate, but we know in our common usage of the word imitate that it has a connotation of the idea of a falsity, like an imitation. So the King James uses the word follow, and I think that's exactly what should be there. Notice there's seven usages of this word to follow, and actually it's not a verb, it says this in Ephesians 5, 1, because that's uh, the passage which is right out of Paul's prison book. Um, and why is that important? Well, that's, that's important because when we come to the uh, prison epistles, what we find is that uh, Paul's prison epistle addresses us in this age. And you'll notice here how I've written Paul as opposed to writing Paul here. I use this um, method of teaching to distinguish Paul's twofold ministry because he doesn't have one ministry that extends from Acts chapter 9 through his prison time and post-Acts. There is a new ministry that be begins after the end of the book of Acts. At Acts uh, 28, 28, the scriptures say the salvation of God was sent unto the Gentiles and that they would hear it. This demarks the beginning of something new, something brand new. And this AU comes directly out of the periodic table. Aurum, gold. Gold is AU. And when you come to understand Paul's 
prison ministry, his post-Acts ministry, then you strike gold. Gold. And uh, it really is gold. So Paul, the prisoner, speaks post-Acts 28 and therefore to us, to us in this age. So it says in Ephesians 5.1, Be ye therefore followers of God as their children. It is Paul's commission here from prison to give us the will of the Father. And we therefore have the opportunity to be followers of God. You say, I'm a follower of Paul. Oh, are you really? Okay, so at least I know you're in some jail, possibly. You're in some sort of situation where you've put yourself under traditions, right? Traditions. They were there. Uh, during this time, there was shadow and reality placed together. Why would that be? Well, Paul says to the Hebrews that the old was ready to vanish away. The old, that talking about the old covenant, the old covenant was ready to vanish away. It hadn't vanished away. It had not gone. It was still extant. It was still in place. So you have during this time shadow and you have reality. We looked at some examples, some really decent examples. Um, this picture, of course, is a, is a great one because it shows the olive, the olive of Romans 11, that there was an unnatural graft where there was a wild olive tree which was grafted into the good olive tree of Israel. And it was grafted in there contrary to nature. And it was done to provoke the tree to fruitfulness. And as you read through the book of Acts, and I invite you to do it, you will see one synagogue after another synagogue, because that's what Paul would do. He would go to the Jew first. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first. Romans 1, 16 and 17. You read it. Why? Why? It's in Romans. Well, Romans is an Acts epistle. Here is the big thing that I finally, with my thick head, finally got. I finally got the fact that Romans... 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Hebrews, they're all written during this time. So why should I divorce their context from the context of the book of Acts? There's no reason why you should. Why should you remove Paul's epistles during the time that he wrote during this time from the doctrine of this time. Do we see evidence of the doctrine of this time in the book of Romans? Oh yes, we do. We find exactly that in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 15. Why there, in Romans chapter 15, we find the hope of Israel. That is the hope that is mentioned by Isaiah. That's the hope that was being presented there. Of course it would be. Why? Because Israel is first. God had not finished with Israel. Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the Father heard him. And what happened was, in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God was given, and there the apostles went out and the power of the Spirit of God, being able to do all kinds of miracles, signs and wonders, which people cannot do today, even though they pretend they can. They cannot do those today. When's the last time you saw a resurrection? No? No resurrection recently? I don't think so. Now, people will fake the easy ones. They will fake the idea of speaking in tongues, and they'll still call it angelic language. And they'll make it all sorts of noises and so on. They will claim that the Holy Spirit put gold in their teeth and made one foot longer than the other, etc., 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 right? But we all know those are fakeable ones. The ones that are not fakeable, you don't see. You don't see resurrections. But these people did resurrections. 
why Paul could simply rub a handkerchief on his body and send it off and people would take that handkerchief and put it on whatever part of their body was ailed them, that would heal them, man. Heal them. Real healings. Instantaneous and real things happen. But my friends, when you get to the end of the book of Acts, as is portrayed up here on the slide, once we hit Acts 28, a new economy comes into being. And once something new comes like that, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So we find this, uh, this passage, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So we must ask the question, what is Christ doing during the book of Acts? What is he doing? What example did the Lord give Paul? And there are some fantastic things. Do not ever think that the things that went on in the book of Acts were some minor thing. Was not some minor thing. They were major things. That would, they would be marvelous things to see. Tremendous things to see. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 11, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Praise comes for, to the Corinthians because they performed the ordinances, that is, the traditions, that's what they are, traditions that Paul delivered to them. In the same way that he delivered to them, they performed these, and he was happy. He gave them praise for that, but he doesn't praise them for everything. There are some things that they messed up on, and he corrects them on this and these. So you'll find, for example, in verses 17 and 22, he doesn't praise them because they messed up. And if you look at this, the usage of the word tradition, you find one prison hit. Now, these are very informative passages. These 13 verses, you should look through them. You need to go through them, as I have in detail, and they are extremely instructive about how traditions come about and what the word means, these ordinances. But what is very instructive, what is most instructive to us, is the fact that this word appears in Colossians 2 and verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And you might say, well, that's just tradition that comes from men corrupting the word of God. And it's only about tradition of men. And that's true. That is the context there. But hold the phone. Keep reading. Because what you soon discover is that there are traditions also that come from God. Yes, God puts a stamp of approval on some traditions. And we find them mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. Didn't he praise them? Because they in fact performed the traditions as he delivered them to them. Those are traditions, and he praises them for When he praises them not, it's because they don't perform the traditions in the way that he gave them. You see the point I'm making? The point that I'm making is that don't think that traditions, as mentioned in the Bible, are all bad. Some of them have the stamp of approval that comes from God, and they are there for a reason, and they are there for a season. They are there for a reason and they are there for a season. And I pointed this passage out and I invite you to go through this in detail. And what you basically have is this nice symmetry where uh, before and after and then right in the middle you have the antidote to the traditions. And the traditions were not all from men. Some of them actually come from God. We read about a tradition of the Supper, the Lord's Supper. And we'll get into that, but notice right in the middle there it says, and not holding the head. Okay, so the antidote will be, hold the head. What does it mean to hold? Well, you just need to read Matthew 15 and, and a lot of other passages that I showed you before, but what it means is, 
when it says hold, it means hold in the sense of believe and put in practice. Hold to. Hold to it. Holding the head. Well, therefore, there's a doctrine about the head. That Jesus Christ is the head. That in this day and age, Christ the head is the major doctrine that you need to understand. And if you hold Christ to be the head, then all these signs, wonders, traditions, etc., they fall away. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increase with the increase of God. So if you want to be a part of a healthy body, what you need to do is you need to hold to the head. Believe on the doctrine of the head. Who is the head of the church? It is Christ. Christ the head of the church. And you need to understand these things. And that comes up in Paul's epistles. And I showed you this. Here, 1 Corinthians 12, that's in the book of Acts. Ephesians chapter 4, that's in prison. So what's happened between? We have jumped the great divide, haven't we? So what we've got we're here, we've got two passages. Either side of the great divide, haven't we? One in the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians, and then one in prison, Ephesians. Both of them written by Paul. Can you see that? So essentially what we're doing is we're comparing Paul with Paul. Or we're comparing Paul with a small a with Paul with a capital A. Right? That's what we're doing. So when we compare these two, you can see the import. It's quite an important thing. Can you see that both of them here refer to this body? In 1 Corinthians 12, now you're the body of Christ, members in particular. Oh, members out of a part. Members out of a part. And in this body here you have members which are eyes, ears, nose, m mouth, all sorts of things. And this body, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll find there are uncomely parts to this body. When you jump across to Ephesians, what happens is you are looking at the susoma. The susoma, the joint body, with Christ the head. Christ is the head. Very different body. Not the same body. You say, wait a minute, you're using the word body here and you're using the body there. Surely there must be the same body. How can they be the same body? You say, but... That's confusing. Why is the body Bible using the word body in both cases? Well, why does the church appear in, in the book of Acts and also appear in the prison epistles? When the church which was in the wilderness is obviously Israel. God can use words in any way he chooses and we need to decipher and discern them. That's what we're doing. But you'll notice that in 1 Corinthians 12, God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, and then after that comes all these signs and wonders. Miracles. Boom. All of these things. But when we jump the great divide, what do we find? It says, and gave some apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the... Oh, wait. There's no after that, they're all gone. The signs and the wonders are gone. Gonzo, man. Gonzo. You get the point? Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you want to live in this time here, then welcome to jail. Doctrinal jail. Enjoy your traditions. Here you are. You're in jail. Why are you in jail? You're in jail because you are second. You're taking second place. Why? Because the Jew is first. And what you must do is you must not offend the Jew. You must do things to try and provoke the Jew to fruitfulness. Right? But when you jump the great... This is not against the Jew. Right? This, is, this has got nothing... Jesus Christ as according to the flesh, was a Jew. You understand what I'm saying? 
This has nothing to do with saying something against the Jew. This is a record of history. We want to understand what went on so we can understand where we are. So what does Paul say over here? He says, let no man therefore judge you in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. The substance is of Christ. And not holding the head means you will put yourself back over here. Welcome to jail. Right? You got the idea. It's a very crucial, important lesson. And it says like this in Mark 7, 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. And we have learnt that in fact there is also a tradition of God, which Paul also addresses from Colossians and says you're made free from those also. He says the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things you do. Many other such things. That's right. You say, well, this is only about pots and cups. And so yeah, and many other such things you do. No, it's not just about pots and cups. This here is about baptisms down here, right? Baptisms. There are all kinds of baptisms. The Hebrews were told, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, etc. And of baptisms. Yeah, Leave them. Why? Because they're a part of the picture book. And if you have the reality, then you don't need to live under the shadows. You know, people are used to tell me, well, you know, your wife, uh, she is not covered when she's coming to church. Well, yeah, so what? <laughs> yeah, she's not covered. Why, is she not, why isn't she covered? The Bible says she should be covered when she prophesies. She does pray, doesn't she? Well, yes. D d but do you see her praying? Do you know that she's praying? Well, no. Well, then you can't even apply the passage correctly, even if it was to me. But let's suppose you're right. Let's suppose you're right. She was praying. Does that mean she should have some sort of covering on her head? Well, it would be true if we were living in this economy. Yes, you would be absolutely right. But my friends, what if the economy changes? What if things change? Well, then it's a different story. Evidence that the economy was very harsh and very exact and you don't mess with the economy, just like that parable I, I told you about in Luke 19. Look at this thing. Those people who partook of the Lord's Supper in the wrong way, that is, they ate or they drank in the wrong manner, right? Then they would be judged. They would be given sickness and death, man. Death. You die. He'd kill you. You say, what? Yeah, that's right. If you mess with God and his ordinances during the book of Acts, you get killed. <laughs> it's pretty wild, and don't you think? Now, if you if you say well, it's all the same, it's, it's all the same. <laughs> no, it's not all the same. It's different, and it's different for a reason. And the reason is because a new ministry, a new economy, came about because Israel had been judged, right? I'm just pointing out here, you can't see that too well. But if you go to writethevision.com, uh, all these messages that I'm giving you now, they're up there, and with them comes various other resources. And there's my notes, and you know, they're pretty scribbly, but they're, they're quite useful if you want to dig a little bit deeper into it and understand it more. Um, this relates to the, the Lord's Supper. Let's just have a quick look at this. In Matthew chapter 26, and verse 26... Matthew 26 and uh, verse uh, 26. And it says this, <clears throat> And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new Testament, this is the new covenant, 
which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink, drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the, that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Of course. So we understand the doctrine that's been placed here. The doctrine that's been taught. This has to do with the kingdom promises given to Israel. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Well, this is interesting. Just look at verse 19. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. They, they made ready the Passover. What was this supper? It was the Passover supper. But do you notice what the Lord introduces into this? It says, the cup, right? The cup is introduced. Well, where did that come from? That came from the Mishnah. That came from traditions of the Jews. And the Lord took this tradition and then he used it and put a new context to it and allowed them to see in their own traditions teaching related to his shed blood, his sacrifice on the cross. He used the Passover plus this tradition to install something new. And that's why we find in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul mentioning the Lord's Supper as one of the traditions he needed to fix. Right? You get, you get the point that I'm saying here. You understand the context of all this. It's very important you see it. And so here's a picture. The Mishnah actually mentions four cups. One of them is called the cup of blessing. So what you have then is you have a Passover. You have the cup of blessing put together makes up the Lord's Supper. Yes, tradition was placed in there. God's tradition in the sense that it's been reformulated with the Passover and re-given and reinterpreted. And that, that came from God. No problem. There's no problem with that. But it's important for us to understand it and understand what's going on during this time that the Jews were seeing their traditions being reinterpreted that would help bring them, if they were incorporated correctly, to Messiah. Okay, that's what was happening. So what we find here is this picture that's uh, completely my <laughs> mess. <laughs> uh, I tried to put all these ideas together in one kind of picture and make it sort of very graphical. And so you've got the slippery slope, the traditions. Uh, the traditions here that point to a, a reality. Uh, unfortunately, people who don't understand their place go for a bit of a slide and a slip and end up in jail, in doctrinal jail, trying to manifest signs and wonders, trying to provoke Israel to jealousy when in fact God has cut the tree down. So without, without Acts 28 right division, I'll say it again, without Acts 28 right division, this is what you've got look, to look forward to. What you've got to look forward to are traditions, signs and wonders where you're trying to provoke Israel to jealousy. You start the church of whom Christ is head in the book of Acts, well then you've got to take all these other doctrines, right? If any man be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. That's what Paul says to the Corinthians during this time. There's no way out of it. If you put yourself in here and you justify yourself in here, then you've got to take these things as the commandments of God. And there's no other way out. You got it? That is, if you make that one simple but very, very important mistake of saying, that's our economy. Once you say that, bingo, you're in trouble. You say, well, why is the Bible like that? The Bible's like that because it ex expects you to study to show yourself approved under God. And when you see it, you get light, right? And you get liberty and freedom. So today, I want to look at something new, which is on fellowship. Fellowship. 
So this word fellowship comes from a stem which is coin. And you get various words like coin, Koine Greek, for example. Koine Greek, the common language, the common Greek. And so this is the first usage of this stem. And it says this in Matthew 15, 11, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, that is, makes him common. That's how it's translated, to defile. You make something common, then that's counted as defiling a man. But that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Okay, so that's a very interesting verse because the Lord is saying, it's not what you eat that defiles you. In reality, it's not that which defiles you, but it's what comes out of your mouth, the words, that little member of the tongue brings in so much judgment, so much trouble to us all. Then the last usage is right here in Revelation 21, 27, and there shall be no wise enter into it Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you've got this idea to uh, make common again in this context of defiling. So to make common is to defile. Let me suggest to you that if you try and make what's distinct and different common, to the ages, you shall defile it. That's my contention. Okay? If you take what is specific and economical to the nation of Israel and you make it common to people throughout all ages after this, you will defile it. You'll defile it. Um, here's some neat, neat passages, and we won't go through all these, but I'll take some of them. Have a look at this passage in Acts chapter 2, because they're very suggestive. They come out of the stem, which uh, comes from a ver verb to make common. This is Acts chapter number 2. <clears throat> and verse number uh, 42. It says this. And they continued. Well, let's just back up because it's good to get a bit of context. Do you notice in your King James Bible you've got uh, these little marks scattered throughout? You see those ones? Like um, You might get it in your Bible. Like at verse uh, 41 in my Bible, you'll, I've got a, a little paragraph mark. They don't all have them. But they are quite useful in seeing at the beginning of a paragraph. So... In verse 41, then they uh, that gladly received his word were baptized. They were baptized. You say, wait a minute, they were baptized. Isn't there just one baptism? Oh, well, yes, there is, but it, that's, a, that's with a different economy, right? That's with a new economy. One rule you've got to get is you don't take things of one economy and expect to make them common with the things of another economy. Because if you do, you'll defile a man. You got the idea? Don't defile the word of God. Okay, it says this. Uh, the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. A great work of the Spirit of God was going on. Baptism was there, man. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' oh, the apostles' doctrine. Now we're starting to see important points about the economy, the dispensation that was given to them, which were rules of the household, right? Rules of the household, man. <laughs> There's the household. And there's a little family in there. Of course, they have no rules, right? <laughs> you can do whatever you want in the house. You've know, you got a fridge full, full of food. Anytime you want any food, just go into the fridge and, and eat. Gorge yourself, man. As soon as the, as soon as the groceries come in, plunk, plunk them down, and the, the rats just come out. <laughs> you know? And about two seconds, it's all gone. Is that how the household is run? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there will be some appropriate 
rules of the house. Oikonomia comes from oikos, house. Nomia comes from nomos, law. Household rule. Right? The rules of the household. There are rules for this household here, man. Do you know what they are? Well, we're starting to learn about them. Look what it says. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now we know the doctrine. It's the apostles' doctrine. And it says, And fellowship, and in breaking bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Get the picture? That's the economy. That's the apostles' doctrine. That's what's going on there. You notice how it says this? Now notice what it says in context here. It says, and in the apostle doctrine, and fellowship. That's the word. That's the word that has to do with having something in common. The fellowship that existed there was based upon ideas and doctrines which they held together. That was the basis of their fellowship, right? We do not have that fellowship today. They had a fellowship there which rested on the apostles' doctrine and there were signs and wonders and baptisms and all these things were going on. Right? That's what's happening. Okay, let's just keep on reading. If you go down to verse 44, And all that believe were together and had all things common. And what's so funny about this is there are two types of having things in common. One is having the doctrine, right, in common, and then that doctrine had the idea of a communal having all things in common. One thing that you can say about this economy that was right here in Acts chapter 2 was that they had a communal all things together. <laughs> They put, they put all their cash together, man. And then they made distribution based upon that, who had need. It was like a Robin Hood sort of society. Except there was no, you know, Robin Hood wasn't coming up and saying, you give me it. It was simply a matter of their will. But if people did not bring their goods and distribute as they should, God would cut them down. Right? They'd be cut down. There's plenty of examples in here of that happening. Uh, certainly at least one which is of, of note. Go across to chapter 4 and verse 32. We're looking at fellowship. We're looking at things in common. Chapter 4, verse 32. And we'll read from verse 31 to get back to the paragraph mark. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together... And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Bang! Here it is. The Spirit of God coming upon them and man, they could speak with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But look at this. But that they had all all things common. That was their doctrine. Their common doctrine was to have all things common. <laughs> the doctrine, the thing that made them have a fellowship, the thing that made them have something in common, the doctrine, was that they should have all material things in common. Is that how you're living today, friends? Okay, folks, come on. Shell it out. Shell it out. <laughs> what do you think about that? You think we can live like that today? How long is that going to last, man? You see, things have changed. And we recognize that things have changed. And people that do not recognize that things have changed are going to put themselves into a doctrinal jail. Well, there's so much more in here. You know, we can't keep going through all of this, but I would do want to show you just a few other things in Romans. Uh, make sure you get a note of this. this these slide series will go up into rightdivision.com. Um, I've got some, some little cards here, and if you want to get one from me, see me afterwards, and it tells you how to get, you know, the, these materials. 
get these materials and look at them and check them out for yourself. Look at uh, Romans chapter number 11. Oh, Acts. Hmm, Acts is an Acts. Okay, I got that. Acts is an Acts. <laughs> okay, now we're going to Romans. Well, Romans is an Acts. So it's, we're talking about a doctrine, a thing which is in common, a system of economy that is appropriate to the book of Acts. So Romans chapter 11 and verse number 17 or thereabouts. We might need to back up a little bit. Let's have a look. In Romans chapter number 11 and verse 17 it says this, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Partakers. You see, what happens is you had something in common. You were partaking of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. What is going on therefore with even Gentiles? They were partaking of the root and the fatness of Israel's promises and blessings. That's what they were having. That's the thing they had in common. Well, is that us today? Is that what's going on today? Where is this tree then? Where is this believing tree of Israel that we are supposedly graft into? Do you see it? Do you see this at all? It's not here, my friends. Why? Because it's been chopped down. It's been chopped. Well, go across to chapter 15 of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Ho! Oh, hold the phone, man! Because they had fellowship with Israel, because their fellowship, because they had the thing, the doctrine of blessing, which came from the olive of Israel, it was their duty to look after Israel in terms of carnal blessings. If they lacked in finances, if they lacked in food, then it would be res the Gentiles' responsibility to shell up. Right? That was their duty. You say, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I don't relate to people who say it doesn't matter. It matters that we understand the Word of God rightly divided. Don't you agree? It matters. This is, this is very important stuff. Okay, let's go across to Galatians now. I mean, I went through about 80 or so passages about this, and I made this selection. But if you wanted to get a far fuller view of this, then you need to look at a complete concordance. If you send me an email, I'll give you a complete concordance of it if you, ha if you can't get it yourself. But it is a fantastic study. And indeed, I will make an article out of this uh, in much more detail. But this is pretty, pretty good. You'll get a good idea from this. Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 9. And when James... James... Jacob, Jacob, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. The right hands of fellowship. This is an agreement with the things that they had in common that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Here is a complete demarcation between these. Notice what it says. James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John. Well, hold the phone now. What happens after you go past Hebrews? What epistles do you start reading about? Do you come across James? Don't you come across Peter? Don't you come across John in Revelation? James, Cephas, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Who goes to the circumcision? Who has the economy that relates 
to that? Well, it's James, Cephas, and John. And that's what happens when you read those epistles. Those epistles relate to the Jews. You say, what? Yeah, that's right. You want an example of that? Go with me to James. Have a look at James, chapter 1. Now, when you start getting into this, man, it's rock and roll, man. We're talking about one of the greatest studies you can get into. And once the scriptures really start opening up to you, man, there's no going back. It says, James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to the Gentile peoples who are scattered around New Zealand and Australia and the islands. Not in your book, right? It says, to the twelve tribes. To the twelve tribes. Why twelve? Why twelve tribes? Well, because that goes back to Jacob. That goes back to the founding of that nation, right? Those are the patriarchs. Which are scattered aboard Greece. Why are there twelve apostles? <laughs> because they are intimately connected with Israel. They would sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's why there are twelve. And when these people here were concerned and found fellowship around the apostles' doctrine, then you understand, of course, it would be Isra Israelitish doctrine. It had to do with Israel. You got this? This is important stuff. Go across to 1 Corinthians now, chapter 10. Um, 1 Corinthians and chapter 10. Now, am I going overboard on this, or can you take a little bit more time? We did about an hour last time. I think we went overboard on time, so we'll, we'll sort of pull it in soon. But I think this is kind of important, and we're making good progress with the doctrine. So let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. It says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, Oh, the cup of blessing which we bless, has nothing, there's nothing about a cup in the Passover. The cup was part of the Jews' tradition, which had been reinterpreted by the Lord, and Paul then delivers it to the Corinthians, and they are to obey it. It says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? This, those are the things that they had in common. And surrounding this is a doctrine which they had in common, which related to Israel first. That's their economy. Well, I can wax on about this, but let's go to the main passage, uh, which I want to look at, of course, which is Ephesians 3.9. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. So now when we go to Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 9, what are we doing? Well, we're busting through the boundary, man. We're breaking through that boundary. The great divide. Uh, some of you have gone to the continent. Some of you have gone to perhaps, well, these days you've got the, you've got the train that goes under the, the channel. But when I did it, you had to take the sea link. And, you know, what you'd do is, from Dover, you'd get on this thing, and you'd drive onto it, and they would say, okay, this is where you park, and okay, so you park your car, and so on. And then when you get to the other side, which I think was Brussels, what happened is you'd get off, and there would be a very, very deliberate movement from one side of the road to the other. And that should... Stay that way for the rest of your trip. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you know what I'm talking about? If you've done it, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a very deliberate movement from one side of the road to the other. Why? Different road rules. You say, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we can drive on, you know, just keep the same side of the road, man. We just keep, as we were driving in London, so we will drive in Paris. No, you won't. Not for long. You will be in clink or dead. Right? You will be. In other words, when the rules change, when the economy changes, you better change with it. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble. So when we bust through this great divide, 
We're into a new economy. You look at this, Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 9. Now, after going through this great chapter, and of course in the first verse it talks about Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Okay, very distinctive. He's the prisoner for you Gentiles, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He talks about the dispensation in verse 2 and how it was given to him and to you would. Then down here in verse number 9 it says, And to make all men see, or here comes a great ministry which is given to us, to make all men see what is the fellowship. Oh, here is the thing that we have in common of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Hid in God. This mystery is not any of the kingdom mysteries that you'll find associated with the parables in Matthew 13. This is something very different. It was hid in God. None of the prophets knew anything about it. And that is the unique fellowship that we must encourage. We must understand it. And we must manifest this amongst ourselves. I think it's very important within our physical fellowship here that we be careful to pray for one another that the spirit of wisdom and revelation, let's look at that, let me just show you that, would be parted to you as a gift. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Here's one of Paul's prayers. Here it comes. Look at it. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. My gift. What's that? That's a gift. You say you don't believe in gifts. Yes, I do believe in gifts. Here's one of them. But it's a very different gift than the Pentecostals want to talk about. This is a gift that is given to you by the Father. And we need to pray that this gift be given to every last one of you. That we could exhibit this gift. And that this fellowship will be strengthened. It can't be strong unless we have this doctrine in common, right? If we are somehow making all things common, then what are we doing? We are then destroying the ministry that Paul is talking about, the fellowship of the mystery. We must recognize the things that differ and hold to them. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. A fresh new calling, man. There's a calling over here. <clears throat> there are so many callings in the Bible. There's callings over here. Are you listening to those callings as unto yourself? Are you adhering to the calling that is given to the nation of Israel? Or are you listening to the calling which is represented here? You see, that's an important question, isn't it? You can't listen to them all. You can't adhere to them all. I mean, you can read about them, but in reading about them, you allow them to speak to the people that they were assigned to. And you take the calling that's given to us today and you realize it today that's important rightly dividing the word of truth and it talks about this it says and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints we need to be careful to do that and to adhere to this so it's a great fellowship in 1 Corinthians 10:20 it says but i say that the things what the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to the devils and not to god and i would not that you should have fellowship with the devils you say well what's the big deal about this passage here's the big deal about this passage all right on one hand paul says the idol is nothing and it doesn't matter what goes into your mouth and when you go to the shambles to buy your meat 
and you eat that meat, ask no question for conscience, not thine own, but the others, right? You can eat stuff that's sacrificed to idols. But then he says, but you cannot partake of the idol's table. You can't do it. What does that mean? That means you can't have fellowship with that, right? You cannot have fellowship with that idol's table. You can't do it. Why? Because you're a new creature. You belong to someone else. So what is the issue that I'm trying to raise in your mind? I'm trying to raise this in your mind that you can't have a boot in both camps. <laughs> you see? That, that's what I'm trying to show. You can't have a boot in both camps. If you've been to Greenwich, it's quite interesting, you can get on the international date line, you can put the boot on e either camp, can't you? <laughs> There's a picture of it right there. You can do that. Yes, physically you can do that. But in terms of doctrine, you can't do it. You've got, to, you've got to understand where your economy is and what God is dealing with you today. And that comes from right division, understanding the right division of the scriptures. You know, there was this Nehushtan, remember? There was this brazen uh, serpent that Moses used. And those that would look at it would live. But what happened was the, the Israelites, what they did was they took this thing up and they started to misuse it and began to worship it. And they gave it a name, Nehushtan, a piece of brass. And it had to be cut down because it was wrongly used. You know that's what's going on today? People are taking things that had a purpose that had a place, and they're trying to resurrect it in this age, and they're doing obeisance to them. They're doing obeisance to it. Cut it down. Cut it down. That's what we need to do. Get it out. Be true. Be honest.